Hey guys, welcome back to another Weird Wednesday. I'm Ashers, and this is... Pat O. Pat O, how was your weekend? <laughs> Fucking incredible. Uh, it was very interesting, very interesting. Um, you might be listening to this because you follow me on social media, and this is where I'm making my official statement about my upcoming open heart surgery. So last Wednesday, uh, I had a test. I had a uh, echocardiogram, which is basically like an ultrasound test that they, uh, you know, that you're familiar with when you're pregnant. It's like that, but they use it on your heart. And uh, when they did that, they found that I had a uh, couple things going on. I had an aneurysm on one of my valves that at the time measured 6.2 centimeters. And I also had a prolapsed valve. Now, those of you that are uh, pro- prolapse was the only term uh, that I immediately <laughs> recognized when they when they were transferring this when they were giving me this info. I was like, "Well, I know what that means." Um, <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah, and neither one of those are good, but uh, when combined, they're even worse. So, um, got these results on Thursday had a uh, emergency meeting with my cardiologist on Friday. Um, that led to a CT scan, which is when they shoot your veins full of like radioactive dye. And then they do basically like an MRI thing. And it gives them a little bit clearer of a picture of what's going on. Uh, same thing as before. They saw the same shit as before, but this time the aneurysm was a little bit smaller. Uh, it was a more accurate test, but instead of being 6.2 centimeters, it was 5.8. The reason that's important is because anything over six uh, centimeters in size could go at any time. And, you know, like, like Jesus Christ, don't, if you're going to sneeze, don't do it in here because you could drop dead. Uh, anything over five and a half still requires surgery. But when they did the initial test, I was in 6.2. So everyone was like, holy shit. And then when they did the second one, it that scaled down a little bit, four tenths of an inch. Uh, four tenths of a centimeter. I'm sorry. So, um, put me in a little bit better of a situation. So, uh, that's where I'm at. And unfortunately, um, I'm off work until further notice because kind of, as I allude to on this podcast from time to time, I have a, a physically strenuous job where I, I do lots of manly roughhouse shit, which yeah. uh, is no longer good given my current situation. Um, probably have surgery sometime in the near future. I'm meeting with two surgeons this week alone. And uh, it's going to come down to who's got the best reputation and who can schedule me the quickest. And uh, that'll be it. And then I'll be laid up for four to six weeks recuperating. You know, I'm 40 years old. So I'm, the, the surgery itself, even though it's invasive and crazy, scary sounding, um, isn't necessarily going to, you know, I, I stand a fairly good chance of surviving. And I'm not really worried about that. Open heart surgery has a 98% uh, success rate. Yes. And I'm, and, I, and that's with like, including like 60 year old men and shit. Like yeah. I'm 40, like I'm, I'm not too worried about that. Um, I'm more or less just worried about the logistics of being off of work for six weeks. <laughs> yeah. That that to me is the biggest pain in the act and having just to fucking call these people and like do everything. And like, you know, it's just, I'm not, I, I, I'm not one of these people that's like super medical, medically savvy. Like I go to doctors and I do that stuff, but like just the whole hospital see, man, it's a, it's a little bit different than just going to your doctor's office twice a year for a physical. And when you got like the flu or something, and uh yeah so it's uh it's been an interesting weekend but um you know i'm here and i i I will be here for the foreseeable future until i'm not you know i don't know when that's going to happen necessarily uh and oh yeah you can't listen if you die i'm gonna be pissed off if you <laughs> if you don't make it through this no no I'm no two like, no, percent you couldn't fucking handle two percent <laughs> <laughs> no i don't mean like that i don't mean like that i just mean like i don't know how quickly when, when oh, i for do your recovery no with, with just with the surgery like when whenever they can get me in i don't know how quickly that's going to happen i got oh. one more test on uh i got one more test on well today if you're listening on wednesday then it's going on as we speak right um, now where they're, they're, where they're, they're in they're inside of pat's prolapse right now no unfortunately <laughs> they're they're so the the uh, third and final uh test is they're going to stick a camera down my throat and then photograph my uh do basically the same thing they did before the the ultrasound but they're going to do it from the inside from behind the heart 
and I guess that offers a different view and they're going to hopefully get more info from that, which like, honestly is like a huge, huge like trigger of mine. Like I do not like the idea of tubes, like breathing tubes. I don't like the idea of like putting things down my throat. It reminds me. You're going to be, you're not going to be awake. I'm going to be awake ish, but I was, I would honestly, I was like, can they just stick it up my ass? Like I hate to be, (laughs) I I hate to be a slut about it, but like, (laughs) I would much rather just fucking grab my ankles and like fucking get on my back like a turtle and have them shove it up my ass than have to lay there like a fucking abductee while they shove some kind of fucking contraption down my throat. Like that to that to me is way more like invasive and fucking terrifying yeah. while I'm looking at it while it comes at me and stuff like, oh, fuck that, you know. So you're more worried about that part than the actual surgery itself. I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm not too. Yeah, I don't want the surgery. I'll be out for the sure. uh, the thing on. It's called a TEE. That that thing on Wednesday or today, I should say. The thing earlier today. Um, I think that's that. I'm not looking forward to because I'll be awake for that. Yeah. Well, since I mean, you're time traveling. How did it go today? Did it did it go? <laughs> <laughs> I don't fucking know. It's there. There's no test that's gonna come back, and they're gonna be like, you know what, dude? And then and here's the thing. Like, this is how. Like, I guess you could say I'm in denial about it because I I don't want to. I really don't want to tell people because I'm like, and there's people that like I need to tell. Like, I needed to tell work. I needed to tell like I have obligations, like that I of things that I do where I'm sure. like. You know, oh, I don't want to fucking say anything because, like, I'm I, I'm still in this mindset where they're going to come back and they're going to say, oh, yeah, that was just we, we fucked that up. There was a smudge on the x-ray and you, you're fine. Or like, yeah, you know what? It's bad, but we're just going to monitor it and you'll get surgery down the road. Like, my biggest fear is that I've I've said as much as I, I've had I have at this point and then it's going to end up that, like. I blew it out of proportion and everyone thinks that I'm like this ridiculous over dramatic. Uh, like, I completely understand. I, I keep my, I, you know, my medical stuff very, not very secretive. I mean, I'll mention it in passing, but you know, not everybody knows. And it's just because like, I don't want there to be some type of, I don't want to be perceived as being overly dramatic or, you know, right. what have you. But um, you know, that stems from, from childhood trauma and just having my, my mom's very much like, Oh, just, she's she's like oh get over it you'll be fine all you do is bitch about how sick you are and i'm like what she's like you're not even that sick i'm like mom i got fucking cer- cervical cancer she's like you're not that sick <laughs> 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 I swear to god that's how she is so i don't talk about it a lot because you know or you know just different things and so i i can definitely um you know commiserate with you there because you know it's it's hard medical things are hard especially in in you know it feels like there's a lot of erasure that goes on with people and their medical issues you're just always you know it's like a pissing contest it's like oh i'm more sick than you and it's like that's just that's <laughs> stupid that's ridiculous and it like, shouldn't dude, be that way dude i knew a girl that faked cancer like when i that's like horrible. one of my drummers like girlfriends legitimately fake cancer like this was like during the myspace era and she would like take pictures with like a bandana on and her eyes squinty Oh and my act, God. I know I seriously and she didn't even do it to fucking raise money she did it because she pissed everyone off in our circle of friends and she was looking for a way to disappear and yeah she fucking it, it's it insane just disappeared like. you could have just did man no one would give it a fuck you didn't have to come up with a fucking like plot line about wow. it and shit but like yeah those so are i those kinds of people yeah and i think that i and because i know that there's those people out there um you're scared of being lumped into that group of people right i actually yeah. had someone message me today um and their partner broke up with them in an aldi bathroom and they oh. posted this on facebook and i was like for real and they messaged me and they said i know i want to die right now and i wanted to be like fucking you need some perspective bitch <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean like <laughs> you don't fucking know but yeah, I, mean, so I, I don't know being broken up with an Aldi bathroom that kind of, that really sucks <laughs> <laughs> so yeah now i'm in this weird limbo spot i ain't working so i'm just kind of chilling around the house and hopefully you and i record some fucking backup shows yeah. and absolutely uh, and, you know they they want to measure three times so that they only cut once it's like once they once they get you on the table and they they crack you open like a lobster it's not like if they're wrong about something they could just like 
I'm like, oh shit, we forgot something. Let's let's sew them back up and run out to AutoZone and come it's back. It's a process, right? I mean, yeah. I so it's just the medical I mean, world. I mean, that's the way it is. So there's there's Pat. Pat is uh, you know, so you guys know he's getting surgery. There you Open go. That's it. I'll be fine. And it's, mm-hmm. one more thing, it's not lifestyle. This is this is something uh, hereditary that I got from my fucking dad. One of the only things I got from him. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, he died of the same thing when he was forty six, and it was never communicated to me specifically. We just knew like he died of a heart attack. <clears throat> so I always just checked my blood pressure and my cholesterol, and I was always good. I got physicals every year. Everything was fine, and um, aneurysms don't show up with either one of those things this uh, this was found because if you guys listeners of the show will remember there was that long stretch where i kept thinking that i had covid and during that stretch they did an x-ray in my lungs and when they did the x-ray in my lungs they saw that i had an enlarged heart and yada 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 one thing led to another boom this is this that's the only reason this thing got found um it's not and it's 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 like i hate to say use the word genetic defect but it's like a genetic defect this is not because i eat burrito station this is not because <laughs> i love wendy's or because i drink beer or because i do the wired podcast <laughs> this, this has nothing not that i used to smoke for 25 fucking years honestly has nothing to do with any of that so if anyone i know how people like to fucking hate and their and empathy is in such low demand these days that like people are like well fuck him have you ever have you ever actually seen a picture of pat o'sullivan he looks like you know he fucking lives at burger king like i only eat there three times a week and that has nothing to do with this so let's not confuse the point i'm i blame our, our friend greg morrill for being so nice to you that he literally made your heart grow like the fucking grinch <laughs> twice yes twice it's normal size or whatever <laughs> so greg this is all your fault your fault your uh it's all your fault greg from all the weird everybody right. um <laughs> go blame him <laughs> all right <laughs> take your hate over there <laughs> or your love whatever and then get also give him an enlarged heart i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i shouldn't wish that on anybody i'm sorry take that back i don't put that in the, in the universe um but uh no, you'll be all right. Um, you know, so if, I mean, if anybody's wondering about, you know, the 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 future of the show, you know, of course, obviously this has been, you know, very interesting. But I, I mean, I think for the most part, yeah, you're gonna be okay. Um, <laughs> oh fuck yeah, we're gonna get some episodes with me on fentanyl out of this. Like, yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Least. That's yeah. what I said. I'm like, you'll come home. We'll record a great episode. You're all fucked up. It'll be wonderful. <laughs> um, you'll probably have more time than ever, really, to research some of these topics. So, hell, you'll probably be better than I am at some I mean, of them. <laughs> finish that, finish that uh, cryptid D&D book, finally. Oh, you yeah. I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we, and then, you know what? That's the good thing. You're going to have more time to work on. Because, like, the first probably two weeks, you're probably going to be miserable as fuck. And then after that point, you're not going to be so miserable anymore, but you're going to be bored. So, you know, I mean, it'll, it'll give you plenty of time to start working on other projects or whatever. Right. Um, the show is, is going to resume. Um, we've got we've got some plans in mind. Um, and, you know, if not, I've always got, you know, we've got wonderful friends in the community that would be more than than honored to to step in as, you know, substitute Dr. X for a minute. But only girls. Um, I'm making that request right now. Only girls. Do that's, not, what, that's what you do say. Not, I don't, do not cuck me. Guy. Do not cuck <laughs> me on my own fucking show. <laughs> no, it's got. It's got to be Kinsey. It's got to be V, and it's got to be V. And there you go. <laughs> that's the only people allowed to sit in this chair. <laughs> well, there you go, guys. There's Kinsey and V. Both. Both are the only people worthy enough to be the stand-in. Right. Um, but no, I mean, we'll figure it out. We'll be all right. Um, but you know, I just want to put that out there. You know, in the meantime, like I said, we've got plans to make sure that the show continues as normal, so it shouldn't affect anything. Um, but you know, in the meantime, give all all of your wonderful, great, good vibes to to Pat during this time because it is going to be. You know, it's it's going to be different. Things are going to be different for a minute, and that's fine. So, right. But you'll be all right. But so it's safe to say that you're not going to be at CryptidCon. <laughs> unfortunately, Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, unfortunately not. Although I I tried to do the whole like, you know, oh well, I guess we'll have to schedule it for after I get back for Kentucky, right? <laughs> In my life, was right. Like, you're not going anywhere. So yeah, well, and that's, you, know. you know what? That's fine. I don't want I don't want CryptidCon to kill you um you know so let's not do that um but that's okay that's okay there's other stuff coming up you know in the future which you know pat will be at so yes i will still be there at crypto con um, i should so. be 100 percent by january 1st that's what i'm hoping good that's really the timeline that i'm, I'm giving myself here we'll see what happens but 
That would be great. Yeah. You know, I'm hoping for, you know, the end of January, but we'll talk about that on a different day. Sure, sure. Um, so anyway, so that's what's going on. That's, you know, right now, that's where we're at. Um, but you How know, was your weekend? Uh, it was okay. It was pretty good. We, um, I, I did some filming, you know, for the, you know, for the documentary. And, nice. Uh, and that was good. Yeah. So, I mean, that was, that was it really. I didn't do too much. Um, you know, I've just been kind of trying to gear up for that. I'm going to have a Christmas party. And so I've been doing that as well. And. You know, my exciting weekend's going to be this weekend. So. Right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but that, yeah, I mean, we did, like I said, we did some filming. Um, I'm really trying to get this documentary together um, just because, you know, some other things, uh, you know, came up. And I'm sure people have seen that I'm very sad. I have a really terrible case of imposter syndrome. And I really feel like I'm not doing enough for just my career in general. And that's silly because... I've done a lot in the last two years and I need to be nicer to myself and reminding myself that like, if, if I would have seen my life now in two years, I mean, back then I wouldn't have believed it. You know, I wouldn't have believed that I've made the friends that I've made or that, you know, the milestones I've hit or, you know, we just got the news this week that the show's in the top 100 for the educational podcast. Well, it's amazing. Top 67 top 67 <laughs> we're, it's, we're not even like 99 right i was like okay you know so we can't be doing too badly um you know but which is you know good for us um but you know so but it that doesn't matter that doesn't matter um it, it's it's definitely made me want to work on things a little bit differently and it's made me want to kind of prioritize things a little bit differently and the sooner i'm able to get the, this documentary done even though I have a timeline and I have a deadline for when it's supposed to premiere, that doesn't mean I can't finish it early and start working on the next project. So that's, mm -hmm. what, that's what it's going to be. Um, so, yeah, so I've been doing a lot of that, um, you know, and that was, of course, a lot of fun to get, you know, back into the filming and things like that. So that's I've just been busy. I've been working. Um, that was my weekend. Super exciting stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I'll have more to share uh, next week about about <coughs> my weekend. Other than, you know, obviously being devastated that, you know, your best friends have an open heart surgery. I mean, that kind of sucks, but you know. oh, thank you. <laughs> but anyway, um, today, uh, you know, like again, like we mentioned, um, it's actually Monday. It's the fifteenth of November. Um, it's a big day. You know why it's a big day, Pat? I do. It is uh, Mothman Awareness Day. It is. <laughs> yes, you have to be aware of your Mothman. Um, it is. It is the the fifty fifth anniversary of the not the first sighting of Mothman, but the first recorded sighting of what we know as the Mothman, um, which was the Scarberry Mallet sighting that happened, like I said, nineteen sixty six, fifty five years ago. Um, so people have heard me share the story. Every if you know about the Mothman, you know about the story. But just for all intents and purposes. Um, it, uh, two couples were driving around the what we now know as the T or what they called then the TNT area, um, and that's just what kids did back in the day. They were kind of joyriding. They saw this freaky dude kind of walk around the power plant building, and uh, and, and then he sprout, spouted wings and chased them through this area. Um, and the kind of the town kind of made a big stink about it. They went to the police. They held a press conference, and then. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. It was everywhere, all over the area. Um, news, newspapers were talking about it, and everybody then, you know, flooded down to the TNT area to search for the Mothman, which then culminated, of course, in more sightings. Again, it wasn't the first sighting that ever happened of the of the Mothman, just in this area, uh, connected to that flap. Of course, now we know that Mothman's tied to uh, many other things, but um, it is. It is Mothman Day, so happy, happy anniversary happy happy birth birthday i don't know happy moth day coming out day i mean that's <laughs> happy, happy mothman coming out day yeah his presence to the world so i guess it's kind of <laughs> it's, a coming out day it's his coming out day yes yeah. <laughs> so you know that's a big deal um i agree somebody had mentioned uh somebody uh uh people over at um wild and weird west virginia said that they're trying to make this uh, a recognized an official recognized holiday and i think that would be amazing so i I'm one that guys <laughs> i'm 100 all for this sure <laughs> mothman mothman day um so yeah that that happened um on this day 55 years ago you know it ended up getting really crazy i mean um the mallets so so linda and roger scarberry um linda 
Linda was very vocal about this, and she was definitely very terrified of the Mothman. Um, but she would go on to do all kinds of interviews and make appearances, and really, I mean, she would really talk about it um, because Linda had maintained that uh, throughout her life, or throughout her and Roger's life going forward, um, they were they still saw this thing. Mm-hmm continuously and um you know they they had weird pol- what they what they called poltergeist activity in their home things like that um but she said that you know as as terrifying as it was she always just kind of she believes that whatever this thing is was just trying to communicate and it didn't know how um the mallets on the other hand i went to what was that oh braxy bazaar and when I went to the Braxy Bazaar, I spoke with um, George Dudding. And George Dudding, and I know I'm dropping lots of names here, um, he was actually present during the Silver Bridge collapse. And uh, George has since then gone on. He's written all kinds of books. You can go find his books everywhere. Um, get them on Amazon. They're great books. Um, he doesn't believe that the Mothman is tied to the Silver Bridge collapse at all. But again, he's a, he was a witness to it. He was there when it happened um but george dunning clued me in on the fact that the mallets are still around um they're they're still alive and they've never talked about it ever again now they did and you know initially they they had maintained like yeah people think we're crazy but we're not um you know we know what we saw and but since then they've never they've never made any public appearances and never sold any books never sold any interviews anything like that they won't talk about it and they won't um, so it is very interesting. I, I know roughly about where they live, which I'm not going to share that information. Um, but I don't know. You know, I, I don't know what they saw. Obviously, I believe they saw a Mothman, but very interesting. What's your so. take on the connection to the bridge collapse? Because I know that's that is something that's hotly debated. I think friend of the show, Tobias Whalen, has like gone publicly and said that he doesn't think that the two are connected at all. And you know, I mean, you're welcome to disagree with him. It's not like sure. you have to. But what's what's your take on that? Oh no, I definitely, I definitely don't think that they're connected at all. Um, I, I mean, the bridge collapse was something that was, you know, kind of popularized by Keel, and, and even then, it, kind of a weird take for Keel to assume that they were connected. I have no idea why that was thought. I guess because Keel thought it was some. I mean, he was trying to build this harbinger of doom story. And uh, I don't think that at all. Um, you know, actually, I, when I went on Tobias, Tobias and Emily have a show called Investigating the Impossible. Um, I did an interview with them. You guys can go check that out, um, you know, on their podcast. And, uh, you know, we talked about kind of what I think the Mothman is. And as people will find out, you know, eventually. And, and of course, that's one of the number one question. Um, I think it's quite the opposite. I, I don't think it's a weird harbinger of doom. I think that it's, um, I think it's more of a harbinger of growth you know if anything you know being somebody who who believes that they've seen it as well and adding that up to the timeline events in my life and like talking to people who've had these very mothman encounters are very personal they're 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 very um introspective Mm -hmm. and you know they definitely change your life and so whenever you have major growth in your life typically it's because you've grown due to astronomical events in your life so it's because negative things happen that and ultimately turn you into a better person. As weird as it sounds, you don't usually do a lot of growing when you're doing well. Um, usually it's because you've done so bad and you decided, well, I don't want to I don't want to feel this way anymore. So I'm going to do something different. And when you do something different, you know, then then things start to change. So I believe that people see this thing and for whatever reason, it kicks off a series of, of events in your life that seem like they're bad but then they end up being the best possible outcome that you could ask for and so um you know oddly enough that's what i think i mean if we even tie it to the bridge collapse at all which i don't think it has anything to do with each other the mothman was never seen at the bridge never that was never none of the reports are him on the bridge or at the bridge or around the bridge or anything like that Um, But if you do want to make some type of loose tie based off of things that we do know, and like I said, what I do know is that people that see this thing don't just go, oh, I saw a Mothman, and that was the end of it. Absolutely not. Their entire life changes. Um, But, you know, if if that's what we're basing it off of, um, then when the Silver Ridge collapsed, it it was a big deal to infrastructure and how we built bridges going forward and engineering, um, which ultimately, what does that do? That ends up being better, right? We learn from it. 
Um, it was horrible because all those people had to die. But mm-hmm. at the same time, like I said, we wouldn't yeah, have gonna, realized. Gonna, you got to break a few a few eggs. What are you going to fucking do? You know what I mean? Exactly. Right. So anyway, that's what I think. Um, that's my, my little Mothman spiel. But I don't know. Pat, what do you think about the, uh, I'm sure you're familiar now a little bit with the sighting that happened 55 years ago. What do you think of that that particular incident? Okay, I guess, uh, I guess you don't have an opinion on it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I lost you for a second. You're going to have to edit that probably. What, what did you think? <laughs> what do you think about the the Scarberry Mallet sighting? Um, you know, <clears throat> I guess it's, it's, there's something about this case that's like galvanized so many people. Like if you look at, if you look at the, uh, the sightings, and the amount of press that it got, I mean, it's almost like comparable to Roswell. And I can't think of oh, yeah. one other cryptid sighting that's gotten that much attention. And I don't know necessarily why. Like, I think if you've heard enough of these stories by now, you realize that there's there's been bigger flaps and more witnesses and sure. more more salacious, like, encounters than this. But, you know, the Mothman is one of those OGs, and he's an OG for a reason. And it's because there's something about it that just people latch onto, you know? And I don't think you could fuck with that. I like the way that you describe it. Um, You know, when you describe some of these stories, it's very sexy. Right. The Mothman is very sexy. So you're right about that. (laughs) I agree with that. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm a little biased, but you know, that's because this is what I do, the Mothman stuff. Um, but it's, you know, I, there's a reason for it. I mean, you know, that's what I tell people. I, I didn't, I didn't believe in the Mothman when I started doing this, even at that point in my life, I had seen it, but I didn't know that that's what it was. Yeah. You know, I know I'd, I had never made that connection before. And uh, but I mean, I was a big skeptic, you know, I, I'm like, that, that's, that's just ridiculous because I, I was very much into, you know, flesh and blood science. You know, this wasn't a Bigfoot. Yeah, hell yeah. yeah. I, I, mean, I, I bought Bigfoot all day long. A big monkey. Yes, I believe that. Um, you know, lake monster. Sure. We don't know what the fuck's in the water. Absolutely. A mothman. No. No, 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 no. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you know things started happening in my life that defied scientific scientific explanation, and you know here we are. So anyway, um, you know, so very interesting stuff. I I would love to talk to the mallets one day, especially knowing that they are still around. I don't know if if that will happen. Um, but uh, we'll see. I'm hopeful. So <laughs> if anybody's gonna do it, it's gonna be me. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, so if you if you know the mallets, um, please uh, you know, give them my my phone number and not not the not the seven seven three five nine weird. Give them my actual phone number. <laughs> 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 have them call me um but anyway that was really all i had this week for the news it, it ended up being a very slow news week um which is fine because uh you know it's it sounds like we needed a, a break to kind of talk about some more personal matters so. yeah no bridge collapses no one, you know no nope, not this week <laughs> i mean there's stuff but just nothing really notable i guess i don't know if i can do your research um you know i'm not i'm not the news i guess i am the news but i'm not the news anyway um so as you guys know i'm excited i'm excited for this week's topic um this is a really good one and uh this is also a very uh, another very personal one to me um probably because of how close it is but not just that i'm gonna kind of you know show some things that that i've come across in my research that i don't really get a lot of a lot of chance to talk about and mostly it's because i don't want to feel like and I'll mention why, but I don't want anybody to feel like I'm stepping on their toes with research when it comes to this topic. No, again, that's silly because nobody has a, you can't copyright these things, right? No, Nobody owns the rights to this stuff. Well, maybe some of it, but nobody owns, you know, the weird and unexplained. I mean, that's just the way it is. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, fuck it. But in case you haven't noticed, we're going to talk about the uh, Kelly Hopkinsville encounter. What did you know about this before... I brought it up as a topic. Uh, oh, I was well versed in it. This okay. is yeah, this is like one of the big ones. It's a big one and, for you. And um, right, because it goes you go back to sexy, uh, sexy stories. Sure. This is one of the sexiest, and uh, it's. I mean, if 
I won't get into the whole movie thing right now, but this is something that um, it's a story that we've seen shades of try to make its way into Hollywood movies several times. And especially with Steven Spielberg. And it, there's a reason why it's because it's, it's very captivating. It's very cinematic. It's uh, it's got shades of uh, gremlins meets assault on precinct 13 meets Rio Bravo. Uh, it's, sure. You know what I mean? It's a good story. It's it's just a good story to tell. Now, how much it has to do with actual extraterrestrials or close encounters or any of that, who knows? And, um, you know, I've heard a couple of theories about what it could have been or what, what some more terrestrial explanations are. But this is a big one. And you don't have to get too far into, you know, strange tales of the unknown to come across this one and uh, have it have it lodge itself in your memory banks. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with that. You know, this is definitely a very, um, you know, it's got one of those elements again, and, and it's got a lot of witnesses. And, and I feel like, you know, the more witnesses you have to an event, the more credible, it, you know, it, it deems itself to be. And so, you know, that's, um, it, th- that's a very interesting, you know, it, and it, it's, it's left its impact for sure. And it's comparable to other very notable um, one-off you know sightings and 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 we'll get into that but uh but what is it what, what is that kelly hopkinsville encounter um so it was uh 1955 um there was a family well there was a a blended family living in a farmhouse but they also had friends visiting at the time and um within this incident there were eight adults and three three children and the children weren't super young uh the youngest was seven the oldest was 12 you know so they were old enough to know what was going on um and uh so anyway this guy billy ray taylor was visiting his his friend elmer sutton um who it was it was his house he lived there with, some, with his mother and some other people anyway again a lot of people at this house um he went outside and he went to the well to go get some water and when he did that um he saw a ufo he saw this big ufo fly across the sky kind of went behind the farmhouse a little bit of a ways and landed or at least it went down into the tree line and uh he ran into the house and was just kind of freaking out was telling everybody oh my god oh my god i saw a ufo and uh everybody kind of laughed they're like um no you didn't and you know they were just kind of like okay my guy and uh so an hour later um the dog starts freaking the fuck out and so billy and elmer actually they call him they call elmer lucky so i'll call him lucky um billy and lucky um they grab their guns because this is kentucky and uh you know on the border of kelly and hopkinsville which is bfe um and they go outside ready to start shooting at things and instead of like an intruder you know they saw this little three to four foot tall creature that had a big round head big giant ears (laughs) big yellow glowing eyes and it was kind of standing there with its hands up like you know i surrender like you would do with the gun pointed at you and um but then it was walking towards them and as it walked towards them they shot they shot it they insist that they shot not at it but they shot it um and instead of going down this thing did a backflip and then went out into the woods and then this kicked off hours and hours of what the family describes as torment from these things um these these creatures which they say there was about 12 to 15 of them were peeking in the windows you know they were climbing on the ceiling and and banging on doors and just running around the house and being all you know generally weird at one point um billy i believe it was billy had walked outside and when he did that uh, over top of the awning a little hand reached out and started touching on his hair on his hair and so he ran back in they continued to shoot at these things and nothing happened they were floating around outside and um you know it was terrifying so after about four hours of this going on the family piles into the car and they go up to the local police station and they say hey um these fucking things are after us have been terrorizing us for hours we need help we've been trying to you know shoot them nothing's happening and so the police go out there and uh they found absolutely nothing except some bullet holes in the walls and shit and uh then they left and at this point um about probably about another hour after the police had left the the creatures that turned again only stayed not as long um, but they did they did hang out and terrorize the family a little bit more and then they were gone um so i mean that is the gist 
of of this incident um and we'll kind of get into details but uh up front did, did i miss anything no i mean that that's pretty much it right there basically the story so you know a couple of factors and we'll kind of you know backtrack uh the family ended up leaving i'm sorry i didn't mention this the family up and left 10 days later um after the incident happened and uh for uh, numerous reasons and you know we'll talk about that but um the daughter lucky's daughter goes on to uh you know maintain the family story um they actually have a festival every year for the kelly green men um, or, you know, the little green men or whatever, you know, they have this green men festival and she, you know, helps run it and she talks and things like that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, one of the things that people had insisted about this story, obviously when the police heard it, they thought, you know, they didn't believe them at first, um, you know, when they went to the police station, but these people were really genuinely terrified of whatever it was they were talking about. So they figured, okay, something must be going on. Um, and, and they went, they recorded that one of the adult men, I don't remember who it was. I don't know if it's recorded who it was, but one of them had a heart rate of, uh, of over 140. And, um, you know, they didn't believe that anybody had been drinking. There was no signs at, at the house that they were drinking, but some people believe that they were just drunk and saw these things. Or, you know, some people think that what they saw were, um, you know, owls, great horn owls, or you know things that that you know i guess could be logical answers but it doesn't make very good sense you know they say when they shot at these things um it wasn't that the bullets weren't hitting them that they were just bad shots and they were missing because i promise you these are kentucky boys they're not missing um they said that the when the bullets hit the bodies it sounded like shooting at a bucket at a metal bucket and that's what they were saying about the bodies you know it's kind of a big misconception that these are little green men or they call them you know the 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 little green men because they weren't green at all they were metallic they were silver and so that's interesting and we've kind of talked about this like you know we've kind of mentioned it a little bit before when we talk about uh travis walton's fire in the sky and how he sees the suits and like i've always kind of wondered if maybe that was a possibility that they were wearing suits yeah they don't they have kind of uh uh there's a lot of things about this story that are believable and there's a lot of things about the story that are 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 not believable to me Mm -hmm. and one of the things that unfortunately falls under the non-believable category is the description of them right Uh, because this is not a classic ufo uh alien look this is this is not they're not the grays necessarily right you know what i mean they're um they're not necessarily reptilians kind of they're this weird hybrid that we don't get a lot of we we don't get a lot of reports of you know and i think that you know this is something we talk about on the show from time to time but yeah they're almost you 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 want there to be an element of consistency in these stories if they're going to be believed like it is entirely like if you if you open yourself up to the realm of possibility that like yes there's there's multiple like species spa- yeah species of aliens that are traveling through space then maybe on this particular night in this particular location you know species whatever came down and and they haven't been back since or they're not as prevalent you know as these other races that people claim to see all the time you know, there could be multiple species flying around and all it's very similar craft, but there, you know, and, and that's just what this is. Um, now I got to say for them to get the kind of response from the police and the army and, uh, the oh, state yeah, troopers, it wasn't about, just like one police officer that showed right. up, they called so, the army in the that air force tell, in. that tells me that when they showed up at the police station they told such a convincing story and that they presented themselves in such a convincing way that they literally came out they with with all this fucking firepower like they right. they elicited that kind of response from the authorities so that tells me that like they didn't just it it wasn't just a couple hill rods showing up fucking shit faced because if that was the case you would have maybe gotten one cop going out there all right. But when you have four city police, five state troopers, three deputy sheriffs, four military police from the new by uh, U.S. Army, like 
that tells me that like whatever they said, whatever they did, whatever was already known to be going on in that area that night, there was a there was an element of believability to their story at the time. Right. Um, the whole owl explanation, I don't believe. Uh, that to me seems like too big of a fucking leap in logic. I think that, you know, th- these weren't people on vacation. They weren't st- staying at an Airbnb in Kentucky. They, right. were, f- they were from the area. Right. I ex- They've seen an owl. Yes. I would expect them to know the flora and fauna very well. Right. Uh, you would think so. However, once again, you know, we got a lot of stories about alien encounters and they don't normally sound like this. The, well, and so, like, you know, that's another thing to mention. I mean, even though it, it was 1955, you know, some things that are of note to, to take in here is, like, um, you know, the guy was going out to the well. It, 1955 wasn't uncivilized times. Like, they, they had plumbing and, like, things like that. This family, though, did not, they didn't own a TV. Like, they were very much, you know, backwoods they weren't into like reading science fiction novel like they weren't into that kind of thing like so it's not like like we kind of when we discussed the betty and barney hill case you know we kind of talked about whether or not um you know a lot of people think that the outer limits might have influenced this story um because they might have seen that these people probably died never knowing what the fuck the outer limits was you know (laughs) so they they just weren't into that type of thing so to make up a story like this was very interesting i know the matriarch of the family was very much kind of a recluse you know she wasn't she wasn't about the limelight she didn't want that and again 10 days after this incident happened they the family up and left um yeah but then a couple generations later they're throwing fucking festivals about it they are throwing festivals about it right that that's that's something like them leaving that sounds believable them throwing a carnival and it's honor a cup every year that makes it sound non-believable. That's legitimately people cashing in. Now that could be. Well, the daughter you know, wasn't there. She wasn't alive yeah, when that that's happened. What I mean. that, it could be. Hey, you know, granddaughter's cashing in on some shit the grandpa wants. Sure, to that fucking shit happens. But right. like, you know, um, I just I don't know. I think that there's. I, I I'm really I I don't know where to land on this one because there's so many of the like character like character moments are there. That, that make it seem believable people do believable things that you would really expect people to do in this situation sure but then how do you reconcile the fact that these are some oddball fucking aliens man and well, like wait, what was the point like what were they doing like they were right. just there to just fuck with this family because they didn't they never if they wanted to enter the house and there's 15 of them they could have and they're impervious to bullets then why wouldn't they go in the house yeah. you know what, what were they doing well and this this whole thing um you know, to get that to get too far into the movie stuff right away, but like it was the ba- it was ended up being the basis for the movie Gremlins. And if you think about the the way that they're fucking with the family, it very much seems like the movie Gremlins. It's kind of like, cutesy, right? Right, and it's like, what's that about? Like, why would you? Right. You know, you're you're a you're a spacefaring civilization, and you're gonna fly here to Kentucky to like you know poke someone's head in when they i don't know it just it's it it's, seems yeah. kind of goofy it's when the story starts to fall apart you're like wait what yeah, you know why i mean what right. what's the motivation i mean there, there doesn't seem to be any you know and so and i agree with that i think that is a very odd that is very strange you know but uh other people had had reported seeing strange lights in the sky that night um so i and i think that's that's why i don't think that's why i know that's why the military got involved um this case is documented in project blue book which they just didn't really do anything with um you know they you know i well of course which none of the it's not like questions were answered anyway in project blue book but it was investigated by the military and um you know but again like i said other people had seen other strange lights in the sky um neighbors did report hearing the gunshots you know they i mean so they were sure they were shooting at something you know and something happened but the other part of this and um kind of what blew and i hate to bring it i kind of hate to bring it up but kind of what blew the the i guess kentucky goblins is what people are calling them now um out of the water and what has kind of relit that fire in people is this Hell Year series, which I've talked about before on the show. I'm sure a lot of you have watched Hell Year. Um, if you haven't yet, sure, go ahead. You know, by absolutely go ahead. 
Not have you, you haven't watched Hellier yet, have you? No, it's on my bucket list for when I'm recouping. Cowboy yeah. Bebop and Hellier. There you go. Yeah, yeah you'd be getting it. Um, <laughs> Cowboy Bebop, that's a good one. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so they, I mean, the whole basis of the show is that they are investigating these this specifically this guy okay so they're it's based off of greg and dana newkirk mostly and they are paranormal investigators and they had received an email from some guy named david christie who claimed to live in hellier kentucky and what he said was that um nightly he was being terrorized by what basically he described as goblins and um he had pictures of these alleged goblins. He had pictures of footprints, three-toed footprints of these things. And, you know, it's very reminiscent of the, you know, the the, the Kelly Hopkinsville incident. And uh, they kind of go on this wild goose chase to kind of to find this man. And uh, they never do. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> he probably never even existed. Um, but it kind it's, of presents... Is this a documentary? Yeah. Is this like a narrative? Is it what is this? Yeah, it's, it's a sh- it's a show. Yeah, it's a show. It's on season two. It's so, a documentary or no? It's a docu series. Yeah. So based on real people. Oh yeah, these are, this is real. Yeah, this is well, I don't know if it's real, but yeah, I mean, one hundred percent based on real people. Yeah, these are actual investigators, um, you know, investigating this this type of thing. So so yes, the David Christie guy that they got the email from, um, you know, that allegedly is a real person supposedly they can't find him but or at least they haven't they haven't yes yet um but you know maybe is his name david christie i'm pretty sure it is i can't really remember i'll be honest with you i don't remember i haven't watched it in a long time well we could talk about it more off the air but uh just watch it um but it, like i said it kind of renewed all this because you had another story of similar creatures kind of within the same area it's not exactly within the same area i'll tell you that it's on t- two different sides of kentucky but both in kentucky um but very reminiscent and then you know they kind of go on to mention other things that are kind of strange um you know what's weird about these these goblins you know is i guess what i'll call them is that i also i have a report of somebody who and this was before I got into any of this. Um, one of my friends is, uh, she moved. We actually drove her to West Virginia and, uh, she moved to West Virginia and she says that she saw this weird, small humanoid thing, goblin thing in West Virginia and other stuff, (laughs) other stuff has also happened. Um, Hopkinsville is right where, it's right by the land between the lakes and we've kind of talked about the land between the lakes a little bit and we're probably going to talk about it very soon in a future episode but the land between the lakes is known for allegedly in the 80s there was a family murdered by a dog man there okay so i had gotten really interested in the story about this family that was massacred by a dog man and it was covered up by the government i get really invested in it and I'd started investigating the land between the lakes. And in my own research, we found some really strange things that just are also just also kind of fall under this umbrella of, you know, general weird high strangeness. And, uh, you know, including one of the things I was talking to somebody about it and uh, I don't remember who it was. It was really late at night. OK, I remember that it was probably like one o'clock in the morning and I'm on the phone talking to somebody and I'm like, how far away is this place for me? Because I haven't found evidence of this family murdered by a dog man. Um, but, you know, I want to go there. And I'm, I'm in Ohio. I'm like, how far away is this place? So I Google it while I'm talking to them. And I'm, when you Google a place, you know, when you, when you pull up Google Maps and you, and you Google anywhere, right, there is a little graph and it tells you, like, it tells you, like, roughly if the place is busy or not. Like, I'm sure you guys have seen this. So it'll tell you, like, there's, like, a your time slot for what time it is right now is always highlighted in, like, a hot pink color to show you how busy it is right now. Sure. Right? And then throughout the day, it shows, you know, what, when their busiest times are. So when I Google the land between the lakes and I find out it's, like, two hours away, 
Um, and again, it's like one o'clock in the morning. I, you know, I see that little graph. And at that time where I was right then and there, the bar for my time is completely full to the top, completely to the top full. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. Why is it so fucking busy right now at one o'clock in the morning? But I didn't think anything of it because technology is weird, right? Maybe it was a glitch. That's fine. So about two weeks later, um, Anne comes over and, and we're doing research um, and we're just talking about other things. But I'm, I'm starting to tell her about this land between the lakes thing because that's Anne shit right there is history. So, you know, I start cluing her in, you know, so she knows what basically I tell Anne what to do and she does it and uh, <laughs> she's good at it. But, you know, I'm explaining it to her and while I'm explaining it to her, she's like, well, where is this place at? So we Google it right right then and there and we look. And uh, oddly enough, it, it happened to be about the same time. It was around 1 o'clock in the morning at that time when I was telling her about it. And the same thing. It's fucking hopping right now over in, at the land between the lakes. It is just so busy over there. Um, so, <laughs> you know, we're looking at it and we're like, that's very interesting that, um, you know, I'm like, that's weird. Why does it say it's so busy there right now? Why does it say that continuously? The last two times it said that at this time. Isn't that weird? And Anne's like, well, I don't know. You know, let me figure out how Google gets that number to begin with. I'm like, cool, that's a good idea. So, you know, since then I've I've logged on and I check it, right? And I check the I check the little graph and I see where it's at every little bit, and it's normal, except between the hours of midnight and 1 a.m. And it's not everybody's phone that does this. It's because I've had other people test it at that time. And what we've since found out is that the way Google gets these numbers is based off of cell phone towers. So if you're in a, within a vicinity of a place, Google knows exactly where you are. And it can kind of track how many people are in one area because of, you know, where your cell phone is pinging off of. Well, first of all, the land between the lakes is a nature reserve. So a lot of people don't have their phones out there. They don't have service out there like that. Some people do, I'm sure. And it's not like a completely a complete dead zone. Mm. Um but what what is it picking up at between 12 a.m. and 1 a.m. to get that kind of reaction all the time? And again, it's not everybody that gets that reading. So it was just weird. You know, was that something super spooky and super strange? No, not at all. But, I mean, that's the story of, of the life of an investigator. It's just little things like that that don't really make much sense. But again, Hopkinsville is located right outside of this area where all this weird stuff happens and these little tiny humanoids are things that people just kind of talk about back in these hollers as if they are common knowledge and you kind of get that you know that's one thing that that hellier does good no i have a lot to say about hellier maybe we'll break it down one day but um there's a lot of things that they get wrong but the one thing that they do get right is that the culture in these areas is that it is just common knowledge that these things roam around back there and, and they, they live underground and they come, you know, they live here. They're not aliens. They live here. And, um, you know, or maybe they come in and out of portals or, you know, who knows? Who knows? But but they're here and people see them all the time in these areas. So, I mean, is that what the what this encounter was? Is it the same thing? Is it Was it the same creature? I don't know. Um, but that's another angle, I you know, I think that is interesting to look at. But uh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> now when i went to get to, when, I, when we were in kentucky this summer i had my gun on me the entire fucking time smart yes but it sounds yeah. like it wouldn't matter anyway <laughs> well it's ex- <laughs> no 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 one got no one got fucking snatched you, you know what i mean one, yeah. <laughs> they help them off yeah yeah you have fun at crypticon this weekend Jeez. I, I right i know right <laughs> i didn't even think about that we're I, I, I'm in that fucking kentucky. house fuck but this is going to be great advertising for everybody that i meet at crypticon um oh but my God. how <laughs> far away is crypticon like the the airbnb you guys are staying at is that any two hours oh, oh from me oh from uh from hopkinsville yeah I have no idea. I, that's a really good question i don't know i'll look i'll look into that um someone's gonna get snatched someone's well, gonna probably go <laughs> take the garbage out and not come back <laughs> i'm gonna look it up i don't think it i mean it's, i don't i don't know how close it is i'll look it up um maybe we'll go we'll go hang out there kentucky's an, uh, another big one that we have to go investigate thoroughly because again it's just this fucking area is weird between lots of the- coal mines lots of underground caverns and shit there oh yeah right? oh one of the biggest uh you know not, what is it not mountains what is, i guess the caverns what is it down there this huge coal oh, coal gosh. mines i mean i remember yeah. from i guess uh, it is yeah what's it called from justified you know it, it makes you almost wonder 
the the story suddenly becomes a little bit more believable if you look at all the shit that i bitched about five minutes ago whatever when we were talking about this if you take the extraterrestrial component out of the story it's a little bit more believable makes more sense right yeah right because it's not a super advanced species it's a weird you know it's like the descent people <laughs> you know well, well or it's they seem kind of fey like like they're little tricksters and they're they're kind of, you know, they're not well, necessarily up to, they're not trying to abduct anyone. They're not trying yeah. to take. Well, sure. uh, yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say too. You know, the, um, you know, the biggest legend within coal mines are the Tommy knockers, which are, you know, little weird humanoid, you know, mind dwelling little guys that don't necessarily cause issues. I mean, sometimes seeing a Tommy knocker, you know, is, it can be a sign of bad luck, but a lot of these coal miners also reported them being good luck as well because they'll warn them. That's why they call them Tommy knockers. They'll knock along the walls of the, of the mine to let them know that something's dangerous or something's off. Um, as long as they, as long as you feed them. <laughs> so <laughs> they would give them their scraps. They'd throw the scraps down the mine shaft and then allegedly the Tommy knockers would, would eat them. But, but that also, you know correlates even though you know it's called something of a different name it, it i would think that it would still probably be the same creature it sounds similar um so i don't know very interesting stuff but you're right i, I agree with that when you take the extraterrestrial element out of it, it it does become a little bit easier to to bite off and chew um you know, because that makes a little more sense if they're not, because you'd have to be an intelligent species to travel here. But if they're not an intelligent species and they're just kind of fey folk um, or or just an underdeveloped type of, of humanoid, you know, then, then that would make more sense for the playfulness. Because it doesn't sound like they were trying to hurt anybody, because if they wanted to, they could have. Um, but, but they didn't. They just fucked off and floated through the trees and did backflips and touched on some guy's hair. Yeah. You know, going back to the Tommy knockers real quick. To, I know, I know I never told you this story, but I <laughs> left film school because I had a dream about them once and I wrote it up for a paper first class. I had it was the the name of the class was idea development and we had to write about a dream that we had. And the dream that I had uh it was a dream that I had around that time and it 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 started off with a guy um kind of mining on the outside of a cliff in california and it was like if it, if it was the opening scene of a movie it like you know the title card would say like california 1874 or something right and there was a guy repelling off the side of a cliff and he was using dynamite to blow holes in the cliff and then look for gold or look for mineral deposits right and in the process of doing this you know he's like you know, mining and blowing holes and shit while he's while he's kind of hanging off the side of this cliff doing this uh a hand comes out from the cliff and like cuts the guy's rope and he falls and he dies right oh, and that, okay. that that was like the opening scene cut to modern day and it was myself and another guy sitting in traffic and we were like secret service agents or something and we were in washington dc and which is on obviously the other coast so we go from the west coast all the way to the east coast and we're sitting in traffic and uh there's a construction crew doing uh you know they're working on a sewer main or something and there's this big explosion a bunch of steam comes out and a bunch of construction workers start crawling out of the out of the uh manholes and stuff and you know we're stuck in traffic and we're like what the fuck is going on and suddenly this like huge swarm of these little dwarves come up from it's like subterranean like come up through the sewers and start overrunning all the cars in traffic and they have these like giant battle axes and they start killing all the people in the cars and uh me and my partner get out because like i said we're like secret service agents or something we start shooting these things and there's a big battle in the streets and all this shit and the the narrative that i rationalized after the fact after i woke up was that there was this race of subterranean beings that had been uh were, were native to this land before we got here and through our urbanization we've kind of forced them all over the united states to have to live underground and we finally pushed them all the way back to the east coast and like this was like we finally pushed them out where there's nowhere else for them to go and now they were going to come up from underground 
and attack the humans and that's what was happening in this dream and uh the class was i was movie idea development and it had to be something based on a dream that we had so i was like well this dream i think would make an interesting movie right because i mean it's kind of like an interesting story yeah and uh, i wrote it up and my teacher accused me of plagiarism he goes you didn't dream what? that yeah well this guy was fucking he was he was a teacher at columbia so obviously he was destined for great things and i don't remember this guy's name but i'm i I'm, i feel fairly confident saying he never went on to make fucking anything <laughs> <laughs> right it's, i'm sure at the time he thought like oh i'm doing idea development now but in five years i'm gonna be winning an oscar and i'm pretty sure the guy never did he never but did. <laughs> uh no of course not but uh yeah so the dude was just an asshole but um and we got in a big fight about it but it, but there's something about that story that always stuck with me and even now you know 20 years later i can recount it like off the back of my hand well, so sure. yeah i think that that's an interesting um lens to view this uh the hopkinsville uh goblins through as you know what what if we just take the throw the ufo thing out and just say that these things were subterranean based or they were fey you know what i mean i think it makes a hell of a lot more sense sure you know yeah absolutely i mean you know and there's other like we small weird stuff you know centering around it which i mean it's not science it's not scientifically based or at least any science that we have right now that makes it make any sense but like the first ufo that i ever saw and i've told this story before um but the first ufo that i ever saw and i'm scared of aliens i'm sure i'm said i've said this before too on the show and i know that sounds ridiculous no it doesn't it, it sounds like it but i'm scared it's completely, to death it's completely <laughs> rational of course they they can just like overpower you instantaneously like there's oh, yeah. no battle there's no struggle exactly. they just like look at you and then like you're paralyzed like well, right and that you know that's a reality that i've thought that i've thought about you know pat you and i have talked about it because i've talked about you know getting close to somebody really in particular and you know the reality of me meeting these these aliens and you know what that would mean and if they did it sounds crazy but yeah and i think I, we talked about it on the show if i did go on their planet what does that mean you know um but i'm scared of them and so the first the first time i ever saw a ufo was 18 and um i was sitting outside i was i lived at my parents house and i was sitting outside and i was smoking a cigarette and i saw these huge slow moving they look like headlights that kind of they were kind of it was weird because the way they were moving, like I said, they looked like headlights, but they were like wobbling kind of back and forth. And that's like how it was moving. Um, and it kind of came up over the tree line and then up over the house and it, and it left, made no noise, none at all. And um, they weren't fucking lanterns. You know, this was probably 2009, 2000, maybe 2010. Um, so it wasn't drones, you know, it was weird and it scared the shit out of me. So I went inside, I'm scared. And so, um, but, you know, I was kind of into this stuff at the time a little bit. And there was this website that I knew of that was like a forum that you could go on and see people's, um, you know, see people reporting UFO sightings or whatever. And I wanted, and it was specific to Ohio. And um, I wanted to see, you know, if anybody else had seen this and if anybody else had reported it, I want to share my own story. Um, but it wasn't like a forum. It was just like entries. Like you couldn't comment on stuff. It was just like entries. I can't find the website again. It's like a message book or something. Kind of, yeah, yeah, like like an online guest book, basically. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, UFO yeah. sightings, and um, you know, I'm reading, I'm reading through the encounters, and I'd kind of read it over the course of a couple of days because again, it is all of Ohio, and so and it was updated very regularly. And uh, when I was reading about it, I came across one person's entry that was begging for help. And what they were saying was that they were located, they lived at, they, they lived in this really middle of nowhere town, I can't remember where, in Ohio, and, and we have that, we got farmland here, and um, they were being terrorized by these little four foot tall humanoid creatures outside of their home, they felt like they were trapped in their home, they couldn't leave, they needed somebody to come help, and um, that scared the shit out of me, that's really, I was like, oh, I'm done. And uh, because I don't know, could it have just been some fuckwad on the internet putting something out there because it's the internet and you can? Sure, absolutely. But could it be somebody that was genuinely calling for help because they were being terrorized by these humanoids, especially in an area where these humanoids have been reported to exist otherwise? Um, or, you know, at least we, as we know of now, it absolutely could have been. 
Um, but that always also reminded me of the Kelly Hopkins bill encounter. Yeah, they could, very have, similar. they could have been on drugs too. Like if that was absolutely, they could have been. If that was, if that was actually happening, you know, I granted, like in, in the Kelly Hopkinsville case, it was the 1950s. It was pre-internet, but even those people had enough sense back in the day to go to the fucking police, right? Like you know, that's that's one of the linchpins of their story was that they went to the police and they got a whole bunch of attention. Um, you know, if you're in a situation where there's unknown creatures outside your house trying to get in and they're terrorizing you and your, your instinct is to go post about it online. Um, you know, I mean, I guess I could, I could potentially see now that I now now that I think about it, I could see myself tweeting during that, like <laughs> getting on Twitter, but if, yeah. if, especially if I was, yeah. especially if I was fucked up, I think there might, there might've been some kind of chemical situation going on there as well. Like, they were on drugs and they thought something was outside the house trying to get in you know could have been. i mean that's a very real possibility now 18 year old me did not know that no I've, i think i've shared this story before on the show too but that ufo encounter that i had I'll, I'll tell this story that ufo encounter that i had i ended up telling that to somebody i had found a post on craigslist mm-hmm. and you know for people that don't know what craigslist is um you can go <laughs> on there and buy stuff and people and other things. It's a very <laughs> shady place. Um, couch, a car, a blowjob, fucking anything. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, it's but I selling too. You can get rid of CDs, DVDs, all kinds jobs. of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was I was on Craigslist. This was probably about two years after I'd seen this thing. Um, but I came across a post from a film student that went to Wright State University, which has a film department. It's a big film school here. Um, and they were looking for people to share their alien and ufo encounters because they were making a film for their class about you know aliens or whatever and uh they were looking for people so i answered i was like okay well i've seen a ufo yeah i'll share that and uh so you know i I emailed the guy uh we met up at a coffee shop here locally at you know a very local a very you know public place and um you know I i shared my story i shared my my story about the you know what i saw wasn't a big deal um but then a couple of years later and i know it was a couple of years because it was i was i was, when i saw the guy when i went and talked to him i went with my husband so i was married and this was after i was out <laughs> i was out of my marriage a couple of years later the same exact fucking post is posted i'm a film student at wright state university i'm looking for people to share their ufo and alien encounters with me because i'm making a film on it and that was weird to me so it makes me wonder did i encounter uh the the new age men in black what was this maybe it was just another person who's into this stuff and they're an investigator they don't know how to ask so they put it as a front as if they're in film school i don't know you know maybe it's just an enthusiast how many years were in between I, i would say probably at least three can't tell you exactly how many years we're in between but probably, i would say at least three. Oh, dude i went to community college for like six years i mean that's not that's not unheard of no i mean i think it's definitely the same project yeah i mean <laughs> the same film project how long like... have you been working on that fucking mothman documentary for well you're right but to say it's for for school oh, no i know no i think it's it's in, it's entirely possible that's probably like when you think about it that is like the easiest uh psyop or like you know what cover I mean? right like, yes way to collect people's stories and just kind of like do you i would almost think that would be like a, a not like a initiation but you know if you were in the cia like this is something that you have to do like your first year like it's one of the, like your first assignments is just to go make a post see who shows up see what info just falls in your lap and you never know you know what i mean maybe it leads to something maybe it leads to nothing i mean if you if the the book i was talking about last last episode about this uh disinformation campaigns about how a lot of times some of these campaigns started because people civilians came across uh operations or or uh information or something that wasn't ufo related but to mask it's real what it was really being used for they came up with the ufo cover story and i could see that too like 
you know, sure. or you guys being in the area of the Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Well, exactly. They, Wright State is, is used to be a part of Wright Pat. Yeah, where it could be like, you know what? Let's let's just see what people are seeing out there. Let's right. throw this out there and see how much of our experimental craft that we're trying to, you know, keep a low, you know, have fly under the radar, so to speak. Let's see how much is actually getting spotted and how many UFO sightings we're creating with these test projects and stuff. Right. And I don't remember because I, when I, I actually, I, I believe I told this story on, um, I, I, I'm, I'm almost positive I've told it here, um, but I believe I told this story also on Tobias' show. We talked about it there because he was asking me, well, what did it look like? I don't remember. You know, I really don't. And, and you'd think I would. I mean, but, you know, as, as much as, you know, that's a very interesting, very neat thing, I guess, that I did. But, like, I don't remember the guy's name. I can't tell you at all what he looked like. So he must have just been very nondescript, you know, which would make sense if you were part of some type of, you know, undercover <laughs> situation. If you were a, a, the new Men in Black, you know, why not? Right. You know, maybe they realize, well, shit, we're walking around looking like the Men in Black. People know who the fuck we are. Let's change that, you know. You know, it'd be interesting is if you had one of your like, if you showed up to that or you could you arranged a meeting with the guy and even though it, word for word it was the same ad someone completely different showed up to uh, right what would be even what would be weirder it's the same guy or it's a different a different no, guy a different i don't know guy. it would i i would almost put money on it being a different person and it's just an operation that they run because you know i thought I mean? about really seeking it out you know once i really thought about it i thought about trying to seek it out and figure and figure it out i guess i could probably talk to some of the professors at the school and see if if any of the students have done a, a film about ufos well there's there. always the possibility that the person you were talking to was a professor and that that's why they're still at the school and that's what that's why the longevity of the project is that for the past sure. 10 years they've been collecting interviews with people trying to put together a documentary of you know and that wouldn't be unheard of people's ufo encounters you know right. but it, it could also be military intelligence which is what i would put money on yeah you know? yeah and then uh, another weird thing you know just i'll kind of jump around just because like these things are like it's one of those things it's what is it the six de six degrees of kevin bacon or whatever it's like this feeds into that which feeds into this which feeds into that all these kind of ties that are just weird they don't really fit anywhere but they also kind of perfectly fit together is the fact that um the, the they've dubbed it the, the house that this happened at the kelly hopkinsville encounter they've dubbed, dubbed it the sutton farmhouse because that's the family that owned the suttons sutton is where the flatwoods monster encounter took place sutton west virginia is the same place which is another big one-off strange unexplainable encounter mm -hmm. and you know again does it mean anything i don't know i guess it just depends i don't believe in coincidence so I don't yeah know. there's you something know. about that area it's just it's all somehow tied in together but not really tied in together so what does that mean you know exactly i mean when you start really thinking about it in those terms my original theory was that um which i don't necessarily believe this now and i don't know if i'm going to include my original theories in the documentary or not but with the mothman research was that what if the kelly hopkins bell goblins what they were seeing you know, because they all kind of have the signature thing. They have uh, the Kelly Hopkinsville goblins have these giant um, glowing yellow eyes. And the Flatwoods monster also has giant glowing yellow eyes. The Flatwoods monster, they've also told people that that, that was an owl. There was no way. It was 10 foot tall. <laughs> There's no way. Right. These people got severely sick after seeing the Flatwoods monster. It, it wasn't an owl. Um, you know, but there's a similarity there but what if instead of ears because you can look at and i'll and uh, you guys will see the picture if you see it advertised on social media i'm gonna i'll share the pic the drawing of what these things look like what if those they weren't ears on the side of its head because they they, they did say that they were floating around in the trees and whatever but if they were wings and the only par portion that they could see were the back of the wings coming up from back because it was nighttime you know, they could see it coming up and over the head, and it just made it look like they were ears. And the Flatwoods monster has kind of been described, even though, I mean, looking at it, it looks kind of strange. It, it's It still kind of falls in the line of maybe that's a female version of whatever the Mothman is. Uh, I think that's a stretch. Yeah, I think that's a stretch. I think that when you start... Uh, 
Now there's a Miss fucking Mothman, and it looks like the Flatwood Monster. I, you, know, you know what I would say if I was if I was genuinely researching this, I would uh, the first thing I would do is go back to Native American uh, lore for that area. Oh yeah, and find out what before strip away UFOs and outer space and all that shit. Go back to the original people and what are their stories from that area? And okay. I th- I think that if you start with that. Because this this area seems to be a hotbed for activity, and maybe it's just one of these magical areas that exists all over the place where shit comes through, where the veil is thin, and and you know odd odd things find their way through to our world, or um, you know maybe I don't know. I, I'm 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 teasing, the I'm teasing a little bit, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and make another jump jump and skip and hop here. Um, we're gonna talk about the window Windigo again, um, but the Windigo is very much um, you know this this area also, and the Windigo um, is not the stag headed thing that you see. Um, none of the reports of the Windigo in Native American lore ever described it that way. And, um, you know, again, we'll talk about that. But the Wendigo is described as this weird, sickly, humanoid thing. It's very starving. It looks like a person. Right. You know, and it's very animalistic and horrifying. The Wendigo, um, in a lot of Native American culture, right before a, a Wendigo sighting took place or somebody was possessed by the Wendigo, they would see, they would see owls. And they would, you know, they thought that the owls were kind of warning them, you know, letting them know that, hey, a windigo is going to pop up again. <laughs> what do they say the goblins are? What do they say the Flatwoods monster is? And what the fuck does the Mothman actually look like? Owls are all tied into that. Why? You know, and then you have other Native American stories that are that are weird that, you know, I'll, I'll get into more at the documentary, but like the uh, the flying head. I don't, know, I don't know, Pat, if you've ever heard of the flying head. No. Right? Look, I mean, look up, Look at fucking pictures of that thing. What the fuck does it look like? It looks yeah. like the Mothman. That's what it looks like. So, you know, it's it's weird, that, you know, how, again, all of these things kind of hold hands, but there's nothing that definitively says that they're related. <laughs> so, <laughs> just some weirdness for you. Uh, but I digress. We'll get away from that for a minute um, and, you know, talk about, just this in general. I, I agree with you. I think taking out the extraterrestrial element um, in the Kelly Hopkinsville incident, I think, um, makes it make a lot more sense. Especially anecdotally, when you look at these um, these humanoid figures that we have, then it's not such a one-off incident. Um, people do see these things a lot, but they're not usually associated with lights in the sky. They're usually associated with coal mines or caverns or you know things like that and so they're coming from from here you know they're they're already here they've already been here um that does make a little more sense you know did something happen to that family i I believe absolutely something did like you said they must have believed that something was happening right and you know in order to drag all those people out there uh, you know in order to investigate this so you know what was it they were shooting at something that's for sure and i don't think that they were on drugs i don't think that they were they i've been drunk so many times in my life guys i got drunk this weekend and i didn't see little goblins peeking through my fucking window you don't hallucinate when you're drinking that doesn't happen <laughs> like that's not part of it um now could they have been doing some special moonshine sure but they weren't right you know they weren't and nothing points to the fact that they were they saw something and legitimately thought whatever it was, it was very real to them. And, uh, you know, that's what happened. Did you ever, were you the one telling me the story that there was a carnival in town that night? And that some people think that it was carnies fucking with them? No. Oh, somebody told me that story once. I don't know. No, but, okay, so the, the the friend that was there, he was a carny. Okay. Uh, the guy that said that he saw the UFO, he was the carny. He, he, him and his wife were carnies. They were from Pennsylvania, and they were staying with the Suttons because they were friends, and they were they were staying there. I think the Suttons might might have previously been carnies, and that's how they knew each other. Uh, um, but I've never heard that it was carnies fucking with them. Maybe that's maybe I just got the story fucked up. But I always thought that was an interesting explanation that, like you know, over the hill there was a carnival that was in town for the night, 
and the carnies got drunk and then wandered out in the woods and found this farmhouse and just were screwing with the people you know Maybe like puppets or something you know i uh something a uh, chicago uh story that's kind of similar um there's this camp not too far from here called camp sullivan and uh it's it's weird people that i know right <laughs> what, a, what a sinister name and uh for people that are uh native to chicago it's like uh 147th and oak park avenue and um there's uh some cabins there and back in the 70s there was a girl scout troop that spent the night in these two cabins and um in the middle of the night people started uh harassing these the campers and were banging on the windows and telling them to come out and if you send one girl out we'll let the rest of you live and all this shit and and basically just terrified these girls all night long and then you know at sunrise they just kind of left and um you know traumatized everyone inside both of these cabins and uh you know of course there was no f cell phones back then right there was no phones or anything like that these people were just basically stuck out there and they go to the police and they tell the police what happened and um the police like take this very seriously and they launch this full investigation and come to find out it was a couple drunk local teenagers just fucking around but for the longest time before they solved the case it was like this big sinister like were these girls all, all almost abducted and they were so vulnerable and what's the world coming to and this happened in our own backyard and who would fuck with girl scouts and all this stuff and it was just some drunk kids that probably never had any intention to do anybody any real harm and they were just screwing with the campers you know but uh it reminded me of this a little yeah. bit you know? very interesting well i mean obviously people do fuck with people that happens you know that's not completely unheard of <laughs> so um but uh, yeah that, no that sounds scary definitely can i talk about all the, the movie stuff real quick so uh this story was so you know captivating that when uh spielberg actually steven spielberg tried to make it into a movie twice once as a sequel to close encounters of a third kind and another with uh the sequel to et and um i guess after jaws happened uh the universal decided to make jaws 2 and spielberg was like ah no i don't want to make a sequel to jaws jaws was good and they went and they made jaws 2 without him so he decided that he didn't want them to do that anymore with any of his movies so when close encounters of the third kind was a big hit they came to him and they said you know do you want to make the sequel and he's like of course i do because he knew that if he said no they would just get some other asshole to do it right and the story that he came up with he didn't want to do like night like nice aliens again he thought he would do something more about like sinister aliens and basically he adapted the story for this and it was about a family that was you know stuck at home and they're terrorized by these monsters and you know blah 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 and uh the the studio got the script for it and they were like yeah we're not gonna do this <laughs> Like this is this this is the exact opposite of Close Encounters, but he was at that point he was able to stall and 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 waste enough time to where they never made a sequel to Close Encounters of the Third Kind, right? Okay. Well, so then he goes and he does uh, Indiana Jones, and then after that he makes E. T. and uh, he takes the script from the Close Encounters of the Third Kind sequel, and it's called. Uh, night skies right and he's like they're kind of in pre-production on this and i don't know if you know who rick baker is you're kind of a movie person right rick baker is the guy that did the special effects for like american werewolf in london oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. and a bunch of other stuff so um he's and you, you could you could see all of the uh you can see all of the um the like screen test stuff online uh and and the aliens that he was coming up with were absolutely terrifying they were grays but they had like human eyes with pupils and um if you've seen close encounters of the third kind you know that they have these weird elongated limbs and they're like that like they're really fucking scary i feel looking. like i've seen them before yeah like, so definitely that was that was spielberg so 
so then et is a huge hit right so so they end up they're going to use this for et but then they decide not to and he wants to do something really heartfelt after indiana jones and shit so he's like okay so uh he does et which is all about a good alien but then et is a huge hit and they want to make a sequel (laughs) so he's like all right well i got this idea and it's the same thing and it was called uh it was called et2 nocturnal fears and um this time the aliens would have been evil and they were carnivorous so have you are you familiar with the movie et oh yeah okay so you know how he's like he's like all about the plants and that's oh, yeah. like he's there to do like a botanist right well this is about um these albino like mutant aliens and in in the in the script you could find the script online they were like a separate faction from et's race and um the aliens come to earth and they take elliot and his friends hostage and then like torture them and they're supposed to be like really fucked up like alien abduction scenes with like elliot and his buddies but at the hands of these like gray aliens and um where it's like it borderlines like child torture like it's supposed to be pretty fucking bad and once again spielberg's like all right you want to make you want to you want to make a sequel here you go here's your sequel and the studio gets the script and they look at it and they're like like we can't fucking do this right so at this point he's th- he's threatened to make the movie twice like almost like purposely like sabotaging it and it it falls apart right so then he just he, he created amblin uh which was his own production company right i think that happened like right around et and that was what he made gremlins through and if you and so gremlins is him finally making this movie which all comes back to the hopkinsville encounter case and that was him once again him hearing the story because like he had made close encounters he knew jacques valet he was very interested in, in paranormal and ufology and he heard about this story and the story was so like cinematic this idea of this family this lone family in this farmhouse fighting off these invaders. Like I said, it's very assault on precinct 13. It's very Rio Bravo. Um, actually a lot of people, a lot of people say the critters, the first critters movie is kind of an homage to this too. Uh, even though obviously the creature design is completely different, but if you're familiar with the first critters movie, um, it it's, it's a family stuck in a farmhouse fighting off critters, you know? Um, so i mean isn't the mcpherson tapes basically yeah i'm glad you brought that up thank you yeah mcpherson tapes is basically now that is with straight up grays and that that is more um that is more like textbook alien encounter phenomenon there's nosebleeds there's missing time the kids saying weird shit like and and they're grays but it starts off the same way it's a birthday party and uh the power flickers and they think they see something crash in the woods they go to investigate with the video camera they see aliens dissecting cows they run back to the house the aliens follow them back to the house and then there's uh but there's not really like a battle there's a there's a little bit of gunplay but it's mostly like because you can't you can't battle you can't get into a gunfight with greys you know what i mean um they'll just fucking turn you off psychically and that's actually what happens in this too but uh yeah i mean, I mean but it's like the same kind of yes concept, it, right? yes very very easily uh inspired by this story you know and that's why i think we still talk about this story to the day because I've, it's inspired so many movies it's got such a great cinematic quality to it it's such a good narrative you know right yeah, and I I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, you know, you can even argue things like maybe Signs has you know got some influence from, you know, this encounter a farmhouse in middle of nowhere with aliens. You know, I mean, that's basically all you need, right? <laughs> so to put that tie in together. So I mean, I would agree that yeah, cinematically, it's definitely had a lot of influence. I mean, the story's gotten a lot of reach, and you know, ultimately that's why the family packed up and moved because people were you know now getting on their property and destroying it and taking pieces away from their home. Like, oh, I got the, I got some you know sighting off the alien house or whatever and um you know was because they they couldn't stand the heat so they got the fuck out of the kitchen i mean and i think that's another tell as to the validity of this story at first they were charging people to tour the house 
and uh, the town was pissed off about that. People are like, oh, they're not, you're obviously lying to make money off of it, and then that didn't really work out for them, so then they just left. I mean, they were going to try to make something of it, but they were like, well, you know what? This isn't working out. We're going to leave, and they did, so I don't know, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think I really have anything else to say about it. You got anything else to add? No, don't go to Kentucky. It's fucking cursed. <laughs> Just don't go there. <laughs> Just don't do it. Um, you know, you will get 411 would by little three to four foot tall metallic aliens um, <laughs> coming out of the fucking coal mines <laughs> in Kentucky. Your ass is um, going to get taken. Your, your ass is going to get taken. And, uh, you know, that's all there is to it. I mean, no, very, very cool story. Very notable. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that, we, you know, we got around and telling it. So what do you guys think of, of this? I mean, do you think that, do you think the family saw something? Do you think that they were just drunkards that saw owls? Do you think that, you know, maybe we've had it all wrong and they weren't aliens to begin with? And now we're kind of starting to investigate the possibility that they weren't. And that's a good idea. Maybe that's a bad idea. Do you guys think that I should try to find this Craigslist guy? Because I kind of do. And, uh, <laughs> no, I could. I'm just going to go ahead and say that you do not need to be meeting guys <laughs> on Craigslist. I'm not trying to cock block you. This isn't me yucking on your yum, as yeah. the kids say nowadays. But no, do not yucking my yum. I say that. <laughs> do not, do not. You don't. You have. You know enough fucking people. You do not need to start meeting fucking dudes on Craigslist. If you were the Craigslist guy, get a hold of me. And Fine. for for science, I want to know what your deal is, my guy. Did you ever finish that documentary? I want to watch it. I mean, right. <laughs> was it any good? Um, but anyway, yeah, that's all I got. So, um, you know, hopefully uh, we'll keep you guys updated on Pat's uh, physical condition and his situation for sure. Um, but until then, uh, we'll see you guys next Wednesday.